now that you mention it, it was a very good, my, my, my very best friend was arrested once, and it, it reminded me, the story reminded me of that, and it's actually a very good story, but I don't think I can tell it <coughs> because it's just too much fun. <laughs> but the upshot of it was that my best friend was in jail in the Fremantle lockup for three days. Actually, he was in the, he was in the lockup because of something he'd done on his birthday. He, he, but anyway, he was in the lockup, and I wanted to comfort him, and I brought, brought, gave him two books to comfort him in his days in the lockup. One of them was Hofstadter's Gödel Escher Bach, and the other one was the I Ching. And the cops nicked the I Ching, and that reminded me <laughs> of the you said just now, how they stole the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Huh? So there you go. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so talking about, um, thank you very much to both of your uh, presentations, and, and I must admit, I, 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 I felt a lot of connection, especially with, with both of you saying that there's, there's a sort of question about this, this kind of immediacy mm. of kind of experience, and, and that this is based on something which um, is not kind of mediated or, or defined by some kind of concept or institution or something like that. Of course, in Buddhism, we call this Dhamma, yeah? And uh, the word you mentioned, arata, of course, is also used in Buddhism, it's not so well known, but actually in the Buddhist scriptures, the word arata or arta in Pali is also used more or less as a synonym for dhamma in the same, same sense. So it's interesting for me to hear that that's used in that way. So that's been. So I want to talk a little bit about mythology and story and the role of women in that. Buddhism, uh, and of course, many of you know that that uh, one of the things that I've been doing is trying to. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact verb to use here: uh, revitalize or help to re-establish the order of Buddhist nuns. And we have all these Buddhist nuns called bhikkhunis, and in the kind of Buddhism that I was ordained in. Theravada Buddhism, then they don't exist anymore. They, they, they sort of died out, however that may have happened. So this is the kind of story that you had a balanced structure. You had monastic and lay communities of male and female, and it was a balanced kind of nice structure. And uh, that's gone. Yeah? It's been broken. And the, the story of that is actually com- uh, encapsulated very, very beautifully, I read this uh, article by this uh, German uh, philologist, Oskar von Hinuba, who's a classical, old-style herb professor, and, and he was writing this very kind of um, analytical, philological, linguistic kind of article with lots of footnotes and blah, blah, blah. And at one point, he was discussing the various readings in one particular passage referring to bhikkhunis, and he was discussing the reading found in a particular ancient Sanskrit manuscript, which is like dug up out of the desert somewhere in Afghanistan and brought, and he said, well, we, and he's discussing whether the bhikkhunis are mentioned in some particular passage or not. And he said that in this particular manuscript, the, the word bhikkhuni doesn't occur, but there's a hole in the manuscript <laughs> the size of the word bhikkhuni. <laughs> <laughs> and so we can infer that they must have been there. <laughs> yeah? And I don't think he got it, but that's what he said. But isn't that beautiful? So this encapsulates the role of bhikkhunis in certain Theravada Buddhism, is that there's a bhikkhuni sized hole <laughs> in Buddhism. Okay? And we can guess that they, that they belong there somehow, but they kind of disappeared. So, of course, there's many different aspects to this particular uh, problem that we want to do, and, and I think that it's obvious to anyone with um, half a brain that uh, we, we can't even think about trying to establish a relevant or meaningful spirituality in this day and age without giving we, you know, women an equal go, okay? and I think that's just a ridiculous to even try to bother thinking about it, you're just wasting your time. So. We have to do this. Now, now, within Buddhism, we do this within a particular framework. We have a particular structure. We do have scriptures. We have a canon. And that's regarded with great reverence within a Buddhist uh, context. We also have a monastic 
institution which has sort of been passed down through the ages. And that monastic institution is in many ways very beautiful and has preserved many, many beautiful values. But it's also uh, become in some respects quite corrupted and quite decadent. So it's very ambiguous. It's not, it's not, it's not black and white. We've got a very complex heritage. And, uh, and so we're kind of dealing with this. Now, when we're thinking about bhikkhunis and the role of bhikkhunis, one aspect of it, and what I've noticed in, in Buddhism, is that modern Buddhism, which is basically any kind of Buddhism which you or I are likely to have encountered, okay, modern Buddhism presents itself as being rational. Yeah? It says, it, and you've no doubt read many, many books, Introduction to Buddhism books, and they say Buddhism is a rational religion and it's all based on evidence and so on and so forth and so forth. Now that's all fine and good, but in a sense it's also avoiding looking at the fact that there are obviously irrational things going on in Buddhism as well. Discrimination against women is not a rational thing, and yet it's obviously there. So we can't, we have to say, well, what's, what's actually happening? And what I've found is that when we're discussing bhikkhunis and bhikkhuni issues is that the conversation tends to focus on or be diverted to questions, kind of rational questions like, uh, ordination lineages and the way that we interpret particular aspects of our disciplinary code and things like that. So we're kind of considering these kinds of things as if it's a rational question. Okay? And we're avoiding the fact that it's not a rational question at all. Okay? It's just simply the, 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 the point of view that does not want to give a fair go to women is just is, is an irrational thing. And it's coming from some kind of unexamined or un, un, un understood or whatever uh, place within ourselves. And so we have to try to look at that. Now, one of the things that I found is interesting is looking at how that becomes um, uh, expressed through Buddhist mythology, and especially the way that the that, that, that feminine images are presented in Buddhist mythology. And, and often what, you, what I found is that the kind of the unconscious elements of Buddhism are kind of tucked away in the myths and the stories where they, because they can't be expressed in the conscious doctrine. And uh, so this is, this is the kind of some of the research that I've been doing in the last little while. Now in, in Buddhism, of course, a large amount of Buddhism is, is actually the story of the life of the Buddha. Right? And if you encounter Buddhism in any kind of popular context, that's usually your entry point. Okay? Many times when you go to a monastery, they've got the pictures up on the walls of all the different episodes in the life of the Buddha, and you can go through and you learn all of those things. Okay, so we learn Buddhism, or in, in, in popular Buddhism, Buddhist culture, we learn Buddhism primarily through the life story of the Buddha, and that life story is not just this life. Jatakas always tell the past life story of, um, you know, the Buddha and various characters. The Buddha is associated with the various characters, like Ananda, his favorite disciple, or Sariputta and Moggallana, the chief disciples, and, and so on and so forth. So they appear in these Jataka stories, which are stories of the past. And what it seems to me is emerging from this is that somehow that, that in these Jataka stories, where maybe uh, the Buddhist community has projected its own unconscious associations with certain people in the life of the Buddha through who they've chosen to identify in the past life. Yeah? So this is the kind of interesting dynamic that's going on. But I'll give you some examples of this. now. If you look at who are the women in the life of the Buddha, okay, the Buddha's ladies, right? <laughs> First one was his mum. Who was she? Who was the Buddha's mother? We have a name. The Maya. name Maya. Maya means? Illusion. No, it means illusion. <laughs> yeah, it means magic. Yeah? Maya means magic. It means something that you see, that you think you see, that it's not really there. Yeah? That's the name of the Buddha's mother. Now, quite possibly that was just a name, right? It doesn't make, maybe it doesn't mean anything, right? But on the other hand, it's a bit curious, isn't it? Yeah? Now we ask, what do we know about Maya? We know that she, what we know, of course she gave birth to the Buddha. We can know pretty much that she died early. We're talking about the reality of death, yeah? Now, could this be that the Buddha's mother was his first teacher? Yeah? And that, that was where that strand came from. This kind of subconscious impression 
before mm. he could he could even know or think about it rationally, before he'd even really been able to cognize his mother as a separate being, and suddenly he's just coming to that, and then suddenly she's gone forever. Yeah, and so she, in a way, is an illusion to him. Yeah, because she never she was never made conscious to him. She disappeared before he was able to realize that. But she's also an illusion to us because we don't know anything else about her, really. Of course, there's many details in later legends and so on. There's the kind of legends you were saying, if she's got six arms and three heads and all of these kinds of things. But the actual ones where um, we know something about her personally, there's almost nothing. We know her name, and we know that she died soon after the Buddha died. But even that is not a personal detail, actually. And there's this very interesting sutta where it talks about all the, the things that happened when the Buddha was born and conceived and so on, and all these miracles that are supposed to happen, light appears in the universe and all of these kinds of things happen. But each one is said to be what they call dhammata, which means, in Pali, means it's the nature of things, okay? What that means is that this is like a transpersonal truth. It's a law of nature. It's not a personal fact about Maya at all. It's the same thing for every Buddha and every Buddha era. So even these details are not actual details about Maya. They're details about what the word that uses in the text is not Maya. It actually uses Bodhisattva Mata, the mother of the Bodhisattva. Yeah? And so if we ask, what do we know personally about Maya? The answer is almost nothing, actually. Okay, fair enough, she was born in the Sakyan Republic. Fair enough, we, we know her family details and backgrounds. These come from much later texts, but they're probably reliable. So yeah, we can we can infer some personal details like that, but we have this idea of the Buddha's mother as a and the Buddha's mother is very idealized. All of these the birth thing, like you know, there's no pain involved, there's no blood, there's no mess, there's no mucus, anything like that. He just kind of emerges out, and then these jets of water appear from the sky and they bathe him, even though he's clean already. <laughs> Devas receive him, and this is very important. The Devas come and take him first before he stands in the ground. Yeah? So he doesn't stand in the ground first, he's received by deities first. Yeah? He stands above the ground. So all of these kinds of things, and we have Mahamaya, her full name is called Mahamaya Devi, Devi meaning princess or queen, but also meaning goddess. The great goddess of illusion has given birth to the Buddha. And Another little interesting detail, which I kind of found almost by accident, is it says that that Maya was going on a journey because in those days, and apparently it's still a custom in, in parts of India today, that the mother would go back to the maternal home to give birth. And while on the journey, in between, neither in the father's home nor the mother's home, yeah, in the journey... That's when she just decided to go into the park at Lumbini to play. And that's what it says, right? She went into the park to play. And I found this both in the Pali scriptures and also in the, in the Sanskrit scriptures, Sarvasti Bhadana. It says that she wanted to go into the park to play. And it's when she went into the park to play, that's when she gave birth to the Buddha. So neither in the mother nor in the father's home, in the wilderness, in the park, the play of magic. And this is where the Buddha was born. Quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And then she disappears, like a magic show. Yeah, she vanishes. Yeah. So the Buddha is brought up by his second mother. Yeah. So he has two mothers. Maya is one, and Mahapajapati is the other. So this is his Maya's sister. Yeah. Who is the. Uh, uh, foster mother, she suckled the baby, fed her with her own breast, fed, fed him with her own breast milk, and brought brought him up. So she did the dirty work, <laughs> right? She was the one changing the nappies. Yeah, she was the one who was there every day, getting up in the night time to, to hold him and rock him as he's crying and so on. Yeah. And so she's like the earthly or the worldly mother, and, and Maya is the spiritual or the heavenly mother. And this actually, this motif, if you're familiar with mythology, is one of the classic motifs of mythology, is that the parents are split into two. You have the divine mother and father, and the, and the worldly mother and father. And almost every myth of every, every uh, 
great hero or whatever, then you find this motif worked in there somehow. And so you have this split. And so she is the one who's involved in the world and she's the stepmother, right? Now, when have you ever heard of a stepmother who wasn't wicked, <laughs> right? So she's the one who everything bad can be projected on her, yeah? Everything good has been projected on Maya because she's conveniently out of the way. So you can get this very idealised impression of the Buddha's mother, who's actually just a figment of our imagination. Yeah? And then that leaves the negative stuff to be dumped on top of Mahavajapati. So, later on, the Buddha, of course, uh, just skip over big chunks of everything, and then he went forth, he became a monk, he got enlightened. There you go, enlightened, that's great. Later on, he goes back home. Okay. Now, uh, when he goes back home, the relations with his family are very interesting and uh, quite complex. And I, I can't go into all of the things here, but it's just to notice that um, it was actually the Buddha's relatives who caused most of the problems in Buddhism. Yeah, and we all know about Devadatta, was like the Judas of the Buddha's story. Yeah, the Buddha's cousin and various others who were less uh, evil but still misbehaved in one way or another. Now. At this time, we have the story, as it has been passed down, of the founding of the Bhikkhuni order. And that story, of course, is the story where Mahabhajapati, the Buddha's foster mother, comes to ask for ordination. Okay? Now, this story has been, is found very widely. It's repeated across all the different schools of Buddhism, all the traditions of Buddhism. It's found in the early er strata of texts, although not in the earliest strata of all but certainly I would date the story to within one or two hundred years after the Buddha passed away, so certainly quite an early story. And in this particular story, uh, Mahapajapati goes to the Buddha and says, oh, I want to go forth as a bhikkhuni and practice the Dhamma. Now, was what, what would you imagine that a fully enlightened Buddha would do? Of course, he would say, great, come on, practice the Dhamma. Okay? Whenever the monks any men went to him to ask for ordination, he would use the phrase, especially in those early years, years he would use the phrase, Ehi bhikkhu, okay, come bhikkhu, live the holy life for the complete ending of suffering. Yeah? But with Mahapajapati, he says, don't say that. Don't ask for ordination for women. Right? Three times she asks, three times he says no. Then she leaves. Yeah? Now, problematic, isn't it? <laughs> then later on, he goes away. She and the rest of the ladies, who were like the, kind of the upper class ladies, you know, they were driving their kind of, I don't know, SUVs or something like that. <laughs> or something like that. Anyway, they, they were from Kilara or something. <laughs> <laughs> and they... And they uh, all put the, shaved their head and put robes on and then went following up, again, walking on the journey, with sore feet, okay? Fake monks, right? They hadn't got a proper ordination or anything. They were just, they were, they were pretend monks, just like she was a pretend mum, yeah? So she wasn't the real mum, but she kind of was, but then she wasn't the real mum, but she kind of was. So she's kind of following after. She gets to the monastery where the Buddha's staying in, and they, they stand outside the gates, weeping. Yeah? Outside of the gates, weeping. And uh, so again, you know, you can just notice the kind of the, the, the projections on Mahapajan. She's a fake monk, fake monk. She's crying. Right? Which no self-respecting monk would ever do. <laughs> right? And uh, so she's got all these kind of womanly weaknesses, and uh, and she's yeah. So then Ananda comes along, right? Now Ananda, of course, the Buddha's uh, one of the Buddha's relatives also, and he was very he's very kind of 
soft-hearted. And he comes along, he sees his auntie there, he says, oh, what's, what's going on, what's the problem? And then she tells him the story. He says, okay, I'll take the message to the Buddha. He goes and says, Lord, it would be good if you were to give ordination to Mahapajapati. And he says, don't ask that again three times. Okay? Finally, Ananda says, but Lord... Uh, and, and it's interesting that here, there's two... Well, there's really three things that are said here. And the sequence in which they're said, the emphasis with which they are, and so on, is in different ways in different traditions. Okay, so we can't. There's, the story is told again and again and again, which is quite interesting. One of them it says that Mahapaja, that the Buddha owed Mahapajapati great favor because she brought him up, she fed him on her own breast milk, and so on and so forth. Therefore, he should have the gratitude. Second reason, the uh, he said, Ananda said that. Uh, or ask whether they had bhikkhunis in all the dispensation, all the Buddhas. Okay, so according to, according to Buddhist cosmology, there are many, many Buddhas in the past and in the future. And so, did they have bhikkhuni ordination as well? And he said, yes, they do. Okay, in most versions, in one version, he said, no, they don't. Right? So <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> but most of the time, he said, yes, they do. And the third thing is. Uh, if they ordain, can they get enlightened? Right? And the Buddha said, yes, they are capable of full enlightenment. Okay? So there's a very interesting ambiguity in the whole thing. On the one hand, there's an absolute clear, crystal clear cut spiritual statement that says that women are capable of exactly the same spiritual goal as men, and there's no difference whatsoever. And that's black and white, and right there in the earliest texts and found across all the different traditions, and is not at all contested. And on the other hand, there's this thing of saying, no, you can't ordain. And so then he's like, well, what's going on here? And the Buddha doesn't say anything at that stage. Or maybe he does, or maybe he doesn't, because we hear the story from many different voices, told by many different times by many different people, none of whom were bhikkhunis. Right? <laughs> we heard the story told by different groups of bhikkhus. Now, then he says, okay, I'll give her eight rules Okay, and then then that can be her ordination. So the eight rules. The first number, first rule. I won't go into all of them. The first rule says that a bhikkhuni who's ordained for a hundred years must bow down to a monk even ordained on that very day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I don't know why, but some women have a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> Feminists and stuff. <laughs> but. As far as I'm aware, the monks don't have a problem. <laughs> it should be all right. Um, now, anyway, and there's a bunch of other rules which we don't come to time to go into. So it's just interesting to notice this, that the first reaction is we've got to control the women with a set of rules, right? Rules, we're going to contain them, and we're going to put them here, and we're going to make sure that there's a hierarchy and we know who's on top, right? Now, the, what, these, what these rules in Garadamas don't do and this is also very important to acknowledge, is that they do not create any kind of explicit power relationship. Okay? There's obviously an implicit power relationship in there, but there's no power of command okay, anywhere in Buddhist scripture. So no monk can have the power to order a nun to do anything. Okay? There's no power of command of that kind whatsoever. But obviously there is a hierarchy established there. So... Ananda goes off, tell, and, and, and the Buddha says, if Mahapajapati will accept this, then that's her ordination. So, Ananda goes off, tells Mahapajapati, she says, just like a young boy or girl who's youthful and beautiful and fond of their appearance would take a garland of flowers and place it above their head, like a crown, in the same way I would take these eight Garudamas and, and place them above my head and preserve them for the whole rest of my life without transgression. Okay? Sadhu sadhu, if that can, I can be ordained. So then Ananda says that's good. He goes and tells the Buddha, and the Buddha says, if, right, if, uh, if Mahapajapati hadn't taken ordination, then Buddhism would have lasted for a thousand years. But now Buddhism will only last for 500 years. Right? <coughs> a mathematical problem here, even two and a half thousand years later, but anyway. And he said, the most interesting thing to me, he says that, that, that like a disease called red rot would destroy the sugar cane. Yeah? 
And red rot is actually still a disease. It's still around today in Sri Lanka and India. And if you, you cut the sugar cane open, and it's stained like blood inside the sugar cane. And just like the disease called Sedatika, is white bones would destroy a field of wheat. Yeah? So this is what the Buddha is comparing. Well, I think the text is, I don't know what the Buddha was saying. I don't know if the Buddha had anything to do with this. But the text is comparing the ordination of nuns to a disease which is destroying the crops. It's a bit much, isn't it? Yeah? And then it says, just like a flood. Yeah? It compares it like a flood. So I've laid down these rules. It's like a dam to hold back the flood. Yeah? So it's, very, again, very interesting. Yeah? It's very kind of disturbing imagery yeah? to think of somebody who the Buddha just said. He just said, yes, they can become arahants. They can get fully enlightened, no problems. Right? But they're a disease. <laughs> <laughs> they're a flood. <laughs> anyway, so the Buddha goes back so Ananda goes back and tells tells Mahapajapati, okay that's fine it's accepted your nation, these eight Gauri Dhammas which you just said you're going to carry like a wreath of flowers above your head, and she says that's fine okay, I'm ordained and she says, but just one thing and he says, yeah what and she says, that rule about having the nuns having to bow down to monks do you reckon we could change that one? <laughs> <laughs> she just said that oh, I'll carry these the whole of my life like a garland of the flowers. She said, well, you know, we're not allowed to change their minds too, so this is a kind of thing. And the Buddha made an interesting response to that, and he said that even other badly taught religions don't allow women to pay, don't allow equality between monks and nuns or between men and women. Right? So even badly explained religions don't allow equality. So how can I allow it? Which again seems a very curious piece of logic to me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but if badly explained religions didn't allow it, that are well, anyway, that's what the text says. So who am I to question that? Well, once or twice I might question people. But, so we have this myth, which is I think profoundly disturbing, and I think that we should. We need to kind of make that conscious and to, to appreciate the fact that it is quite a disturbing set of images. And, you know, it would be interesting just, in, you know, in the future just to notice this, actually. I was just reading a retelling of that story today in, in, in one of, you know, in a modern book, a sort of popular book on Buddhist nuns. And it's interesting that they didn't mention those bits about nuns being a disease and all of these things. They kind of moved right over the top. And uh, I've noticed this quite a few times, is that 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 bit has now been shunted into the unconscious, okay? We don't want to know that, because that's too hard to face up to and to really try to appreciate, yeah? And so, uh, you know, again, what's going on here, uh, probably a lot of things, many of which are too... too I mean, take a lot of, take a, it takes a lot of exploring and a lot of uh, consideration to figure out what's going on. But... Just to um, suggest that um, uh, one of the things that's being, of course, just to suggest this, uh, this just a, as, a, as, a, as a possibility or an opening for interpretation is this idea that I mentioned before of like the splitting of the two mothers. Yeah? So you have the spiritual mother and the worldly mother. So that's allowing the negative qualities which are associated or have been constructed around women to be projected upon Mahapajapati, okay? So she's got like a dirty body, yeah? She's kind of leaking fluids, yeah? Almost every time that her name is mentioned, she's either crying or it's talking about her uh, breastfeeding the Buddha or something like that. So she's constantly associated with these kinds of things. And uh, so these kind of negative projections on women are associated with Mahapajapati and somehow that is going to be destructive to the Sangha as a whole. So the Sangha is the monastic community. Now, I've, I've, uh, uh, to try to see how that may be, one of the things, see, the, 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 the monastic community, or the Buddhist monastic community, in a sense, is, is, is a community which is defined by, not defined by, but which is managed by a set of rules we call the Vinaya, Vinaya Code. Now, the very existence of a rule tells you that there's the opposite of it. Okay? So you don't make rules for something which 
is everyone does it anyway, right? You make rules for things that people are going to break. So whenever you make a rule that tells you that somebody was actually breaking it, right? So, that, so, and this is something we often misunderstand when we read ancient scriptures. We think it's because if this is what it's saying, then that must have been what's happening. Actually, if that's what it was saying, then the opposite must also have been happening. Yeah? Otherwise, the rule wouldn't have been laid down. So, for example, this thing about the um, paying of respects by uh, men to men, men uh, uh, so the women having to pay respects to the to the monks and. Uh, you know, it sounds like it's establishing this kind of very unilateral, one-way power relationship. So what you have is a group of men who are trying to set up a, 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 a men's club, right? They're trying to set up the, whatever, Freemasonry or the, the, the army or the government or <coughs> the judiciary, all of which started out as men's clubs, yeah? All of these things are boys' clubs. So most of the actual institutions we have in our society started out that way. The actual formal institutions. This is what blokes do. Yeah, they create structures based around sets of rules and procedures. And there's always a fear that that's good, because once you've set those boundaries, there's a fear that that's going to be dissolved back into the kind of the ocean. Yeah. And so this is obviously quite explicitly that fear which is being addressed there. The fear that that ocean is going to dissolve and make the sun disappear. In those days. You know, let's think a hundred years after the Buddha, two hundred years after the Buddha. We have a very different perspective. Two and a half thousand years after the Buddha, we know that everything went tickety boo, right? More or less. I mean, we have a few problems with that, but we're still here and we're still doing okay, right? So, we, but they didn't know that, yeah. And they were just one of the dozens of different religious movements happening in India at that time, and they felt that they had something really precious. They felt that they had a really precious, precious message and teaching which could be of incredible value to many people, and that needed to be preserved. Yeah? And so my feeling is that they got a bit neurotic about it, yeah? and got kind of obsessed with trying to preserve the form of those things and trying to prevent any kind of leaking in or out of that. And so this is why the, the, the rules are constructed and trying to try to control that. Of course, there's many other things going on here. But just to say that that what I think, it, in summary, is that Mahabhajapati was acting as a projection for woman as the embodiment of the world. Okay, And in myth and so on, woman is often projected in this way. She is the earth. Yeah, She is the womb of life and death and all of these kinds of things. And... This was being so. This is like the world, in a sense, is coming in. So rather than seeing Mahapajapati and Bhikkhunis as being human beings who are suffering and who want to try to use the Dhamma to escape from that suffering, they're being projected on as as the leaking in of the world into the Sangha, and this is where the danger came from. But of course, that's only part of the story. That's like the official story. But if we look, then we think obviously things must have been much more complex than that. And so, uh, I'll just give, give I'll just give one a couple of examples of how things must have been more complex than that. One of the Garudamas I didn't mention. It says that that uh, <coughs> monks are allowed to 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 uh, admonish nuns or, or criticize nuns, but nuns aren't allowed to criticize monks. Right? Now, yeah. Now, can you imagine that this has ever been the case? I mean, come on. Can you imagine ever living with a bunch of nuns who are not going to tell the months off? I mean, this is obviously whoever wrote that rule has precisely zero understanding of human nature. And, of course, what, what's interesting about it is that I've looked through as much as I can of all the Buddhist literature. I can't find a single case where that rule's been applied. Right? But I can find plenty of cases where nuns have been giving the monks a right old ticking off, and nothing seems to be considered. There's no problem with it. Okay, I'll just give a couple of examples of that. One story comes from the time of King Ashoka. And, oh no, both of these stories come around the time of King Ashoka, about 250 BC. And there was first story. Uh, a, they were going to have a big ceremony. Okay, The king was sponsoring this royal ceremony. They were going to invite a thousand monks to come to this ceremony. And this bhikshuni, this, this nun at the time, was reflected to herself, who's going to be the senior most monk at this assembly? Yeah? And she reflected and she knew this very old monk was going to be the senior monk there. 
and then she thought, oh, because this, this, this nun was enlightened, okay? So she thought, well, is this, this monk going to be enlightened? And she found out, no, he's not, okay? He's been practicing for so many years, but he's never got anywhere. All the other monks are going to be enlightened. He's going to be number one, and he's got nothing, right? So she said, hmm, it's a bit of a problem. So she went to see the monk, and she said, Venerable Sir, you are not in strict propriety. And he, he said, what do you mean by that? He said, ah, oh, you know, I didn't shave today. Right, okay, I'd better go. And so he went off and he, and he shaved and made himself look nice and came back. And then, uh, and then, then she, she comes back again. She says, Venerable Sir, you are not in strict propriety. She said, oh, God, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't shaved. Oh, I think my robe hasn't been washed for a few days. Maybe I better go and wash my robes and stuff. Maybe I'm starting to smell or something. <laughs> so he goes off and washes his robes, comes back, she comes again, she says, Venerable Sir, you are not in strict propriety. He says, What are you talking about? Yeah, I've had a shave, I've, I've washed my robes. Hey, what have you got to complain about now? These nuns are always winching about these things. <laughs> She says, Venerable Sir, it's not merely by shaving one's face and by, by uh, uh, washing one's robes that one is held to be in strict propriety in the Buddhist religion. And then when she said, when she said that, he realised what she meant and he broke down in tears and cried, wept and said, Sister, all this time I've been practising, I'm too old now. Yeah, I'm too old, I can't realise anything. I'm past it. And then she gave this very beautiful Dhamma verse which says that that uh, uh, time, basically time is meaningless and time, time, there's no such thing as the right time and that wherever we are right now is the right time to practice so there's no age in the Buddhist practice. So then she taught this verse and then she recommended he go and practice with a monk called Upagupta who was the great meditation master at the time. And so he did practice with Upagupta, became an arahant and then came back and then headed the assembly as a fully enlightened arahant. Mm -hmm. And then the nun comes to him and says, Venerable Sir, today you are indeed in strict propriety. <laughs> <laughs> Do you shame him like that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is a very lovely story, isn't it? And, and there's another story also featuring the monk Upagupta, who had one regret, and that was he was born too late and he'd never seen the Buddha. Okay? And so this, he, he really wanted to see the Buddha. And he heard that there was one very, very old bhikkhuni, one nun, who was still alive, who'd been alive in the day of the Buddha. Okay? And she was the only person left in the whole world who was still, still had known the Buddha personally. So he went to see her. And when she heard that uh, he was going to come and see her, she got a bowl and filled it to the brim with sesame oil, right up to the brim, and then placed it just by the doorway. Okay? Now, just, just to kind of back up, but this, this this imagery of the bowl filled with sesame oil is always used as an imagery for something like mindfulness of the body. Yeah? So it's like that kind of idea, the kind of imminent idea where your, your consciousness is immersed in the body and you can like hold your awareness as carefully as holding a bowl of oil without letting it drop. And so this is what she put this next to the doorway as a test. So Upagupta comes, tries to open the door very mindfully but can't help himself, knocks the bowl and spills the oil. Okay? She didn't say anything. You know? And he comes in and he says, Oh, sister, I hear that, that you know, I want to hear stories of, from the time of the Buddha. You were there. What happened? How did you meet the Buddha? And she said, Oh, it was in the year that the Buddha passed away. And I, was a, I was a little girl. I was only seven years old at that time. And the Buddha came for alms to my house, my parents' house. And uh, when, I, when I saw the Buddha coming for alms, I bowed down to him. I was filled with such joy, even as a seven-year-old girl. I bowed down to him to pay respects. But I had a little brooch in my hair. And when I bowed down to him, the brooch fell out of my hair. The hair clip fell out and fell underneath a, a chair. Yeah? And I was crying because I didn't I lost my, my, my hair clip and no one could find it. And then the Buddha used his psyche powers and said, Oh little girl, your little hair clip is just under the thing. So he showed me where my hair clip was. And uh, after that then she was filled with so much joy and, and appreciation later she went became a nun and so the Upa Gupta said, Ah oh, Sad, what a beautiful story. And he said, Now please tell me what what were the monks like in the day in those days, in the time of the Buddha? And she said, Well the monks in those days were so lovely, so well practiced and so mindful, you know. It was even in those days there's a famous group of bad boys in Buddhism, right? So the Buddhist monks are called the group of six monks, okay? 
Now, they are really bad, okay? <laughs> Everything bad they did, right? The only, there's only one group of people who are worse than the group of six months, right? And that's the group of six nuns, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although in some traditions they have a group of 12 nuns, so they're obviously twice as bad. <laughs> um, but anyway, she says that, you know, in those Buddhist days that the monks were so well practiced that even the group of six monks didn't spill my oil when they came. <laughs> <laughs> so this is that's how she gave poor Lupa Gupta a telling off, and he was so filled with sadness. He said, "Oh, I live in such degenerate times. <laughs> I'm so bad. I'm such a bad monk. I'm not even as good as the group of six monks." So this, again, this is showing. This is, these stories are really lovely because they show how. Um, uh, the, the, the kind of the relations between the, the monks and nuns was much more subtle. You know, you get these kind of rules, kind of say things, but actually what's going on is much more playful and much more interesting. There's one more little story that I'll tell here, which is actually also quite a little funky story. But this story, there's a particular monk who um, was living in a cave in the, in the Himalayas, and, you know, doing the whole rishi thing, sitting there, meditate, 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 not yet enlightened, some thieves had captured some gold, right? And they were carrying with this gold, running and trying to escape from the king's uh, soldiers and things, and trying to get away. They couldn't carry the gold any further, it was too heavy. So they abandoned it in this cave where the monk was. They didn't see the monk sitting in the back meditating, and they just said, oh, just, we'll just have to drop this and get out of here, otherwise we're going to be gone. So they went off, and so this gold was there in this cave, and this monk was sitting there. And of course he couldn't stop thinking about it, you know, thinking, thinking, thinking about it. And then eventually he sort of took the gold and then put it away and hid it and kept it for himself. Now the Buddha knew that this had happened, of course, using his psychic powers. And so he, he wanted to teach that monk. So he chose a rather unusual teaching method, which is not parallel as far as I know anywhere else in Buddhist scriptures. Now this is not necessarily a historically verifiable story. <laughs> but... He changed his form into a woman, became a bikuni, and put makeup on and jewellery. Okay? So you've now got this tarted up bikuni <laughs> who's really the Buddha. <laughs> right? I'm just a storyteller, I don't know. He, and he walks along, and this monk sees her and says, Sister, what are you doing? You're a nun, you're not supposed to be wearing makeup and jewellery. <laughs> And she says, look who's talking, mate. <laughs> you're telling me off, and you've got a big pile of gold in your cave over there. And so, of course, he was so filled with uh, uh, remorse and so on that he, he gave it up and did it like that. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit kinky, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh, I uh, when he gave it, I'm not sure what he did with the gold. What was the right thing to do? No, I think the right thing was to stop hoarding it for himself. <laughs> maybe to maybe to give it back to the king or something like that. Yeah. So, so this is again, they're just a few stories from from Buddhism about the role of women and so on. Yeah.